Okay. Um, our next talk will be given by Marty Hellman. Actually, uh, it was a few months ago I uh, called Marty, and uh, the, as you may know, uh, Marty has been a professor at Stanford, and uh, he is well known for, pu for uh, public and key encryption, the joint work with Diffie and Merkel, and uh, asked him whether he would be willing to come to Washington, D.C. and give a talk. Uh, of course, uh, we had a discussion because uh, when I was a student, in fact, doing my master's and PhD, I would always go to his office in Durand Building and uh, pose questions, have technical discussions. So he's really a mentor for me, a professor. I took courses with him and uh, basically a mentor for me. And at the end of the discussion, he would always try to tell me what he was working, trying to solve the problem of uh, nuclear deterrence and other issues, very interesting issues and so forth. So uh, Modi has recently uh, been awarded, along with uh, Diffie, the ACM Turing Award, and he's using half of this money, uh, in fact, half of the almost a million dollar prize, to publicize the ideas in the book that he and his wife Dorothy Hellman have written. And the book, in fact, uh, you can find the, uh, the uh, link to his book, A New Map for Relationship, Creating True Love at Home and Peace on the Planet. You could see the URL, in fact, on his bio on the, on the web website. And, uh, in fact, he mentioned to me that you could, in fact, find some stuff related to encryption uh, in this book. So it's a... Uh, I, I would highly recommend that at least you take a look at the book and read it. So, the title of talk of Marty, Marty will be on implementing strong uh, cybersecurity. Dr. Martin Heldman. That's not going to work. Well, thank you, Bijan, and thank you all for uh, coming to this uh, keynote session. As uh, Bijan indicated, when he called me a few months ago uh, asking if I could come to Globecom, uh, I said I had a problem because the uh, book that my wife and I had just finished and we're using my half of the million dollar uh, Turing Award to help uh, get these ideas out, I had to focus there. But as it was pretty easy for me to see a relationship between the book and uh, the uh, material that you're interested in for Globecom. And it has to do with the fact that implementing strong cybersecurity depends as much on government regulations as it does on the technology. And so while I'll talk primarily about cryptography and the history, you'll see woven through it conflict resolution, which is the fundamental idea behind this uh, book. Conflict resolution at the interpersonal level using our mar my wife's and my marriage as the example, how we went from being madly in love when we met 50 years ago last June to being headed for a divorce 13 years later to being madly in love again. Uh, in fact, we haven't had a single fight in 15 years, which I didn't think was possible. Uh, but you'll see that that figures in in terms of the fight that I had with NSA back in the 70s and early 80s, and I think and it, it figures in today as well. So there's a battle going on over exceptional access to encrypted data today with law enforcement agencies, not just in the United States, but internationally claiming that they need what they call exceptional access to encrypted data when it's on the devices like the uh, iPhone uh, that the San Bernardino shooter had um, uh, in encrypted form and when it belongs to lawbreakers. So I've been involved in two previous battles involving uh, strong encryption that bear strong similarities to the current one. And this talk will draw some lessons from what I experienced in ways that I think we can get stronger cybersecurity today more rapidly. So let me go back to March 1975. Many of you were not even born then. 
Uh, that is when the National Bureau of Standards, today called NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, proposed a national data encryption and standard, which we know as DES or DES. And Whit Diffie and I looked at it, and we fairly quickly realized that the key size was inadequate. Uh, or at best marginal for 1975, and certainly inadequate for five or ten years in the future as the decreasing cost of computation um, would make uh, exhaustive search even easier. On the surface, the data encryption standard had a 64-bit key, which is kind of a nice standard you know, power of two type key size, but one of the first things that the algorithm d did was to throw away eight of the bits. So you ended up with a 56-bit key size. That's a much more unusual key size. Uh, they had a, a reason that they claimed was responsible for throwing away those eight bits. They were parity bits, and parity bits are not as strong as uh, random bits. But I won't, don't have time to go into it. That's a bogus argument, because the first thing they do is expand the key out to 768 bits by repeating bits, which is the simplest form of parity around. And so what really happened, um, uh, is that the 56 bits was what they wanted. So how many keys are there? There are obviously two to the 56 keys, right? To an order of magnitude, that's 10 to the 17th power. That's 100,000 million million keys, which on the surface, especially in 1975, might seem like an unsearchably large number of keys. But what Witt and I quickly realized was that you could search those 10 to the 17th keys, even probably with 1975 technology. Our basic argument went something like this. You could build a search chip that could search a million keys per second. Today would be even faster than that. You then would buy a million of these chips, so you're searching a million million keys per second. That's 10 to the 12th. So how long does it take to search 100,000 million million keys at that rate? 100,000 seconds, which is about a day. And we figured that the equivalent cost was about $10,000. Now, um, let's see. Uh, at first, we thought this was a mistake. And so I wrote to NBS telling them they needed to increase the key size. But over a period of about six months and multiple letters back and forth, it became clear that the 56-bit key size was not a mistake. It was a feature. The feature was designed so that uh, the American National Security Agency, or NSA, could break the cipher if they needed to. Now, they have a legitimate reason for wanting to do that. This was going to be a publicly available, a, a, an international standard, or an American standard, but it became an international standard. It would be used by foreign governments, it would be used by terrorists, it would be used by criminals. Now, of course, I was focusing on its use by commercial entities who needed strong encryption. Um, let's see. Soon after DES was announced, uh, that was March 75, uh, a few months later, Witt and I, and independently Ralph Merkel, working as a, grad, a at that point a master's student at Berkeley, uh, came up with the ideas of uh, the idea of public key cryptography. And this suddenly changed the game in a major way. Uh, in the intervening years, I've determined. I have strong indications that the 56-bit key size was regarded by NSA as actually quite large. And I can understand their perspective. Prior to the DES being available, most data was not encrypted at all. What was encrypted was encrypted with commercial systems that had roughly 40-bit keys. A 56-bit key takes 65,000 times as much cost to break as a 40-bit key. So this was a huge barrier as far as they were concerned. When you're getting stuff for nothing, even 56 bits, even $10,000 per solution is expensive. But the indications I have are that NSA reasoned key, uh, changing keys is very expensive. Prior to public key cryptography, you did it by sending a courier, a registered letter. And so they reasoned that people would not change keys very often. And so whatever number they had, let's call it $10,000 a solution, was reasonable because that would get them not just today's data, but tomorrow's data and probably the data for that key forever because people would not change keys. But with public key cryptography, the cost of changing keys became minuscule. You could change keys every day, every hour, every minute, even every few seconds if you wanted to. And so suddenly 56 bits became a large barrier. 
Um, the DES Kisai's fight, uh, and it did become a major battle, led in uh, January 1976, uh, so uh, about t nine, ten months after the announcement of DES, uh, two high-level NSA employees flew out to California specifically to talk with me and WIT and to try to get us to be quiet. And when we met with them, what they said was, and this is almost an exact quote, you're wrong. That is, we're wrong about the key size being too small. But please be quiet. If you keep talking this way, you are going to cause grave harm to your nation's security. So that night, I went home to try to figure out the right thing to do. I had been preparing up for a battle because uh, it was, became clear we needed to fight them politically, we needed to fight them in the press. And so was I still going to do what my intellect had previously told me, which was to go public with this problem and try to get congressional hearings and major media coverage, or should I do what these NSA employees were telling me and be quiet? Well, as I sat down to figure out the right thing to do, and this is a story that I don't have time to go into a detail, but it's, it's a, a, in chapter two of this book uh, that uh, Bijan mentioned, A New Map for Relationships. Um, the idea bubbled up, it popped into my head. Forget about what's right and wrong. You have a tiger by the tail. You'll never have as much chance to influence the world, to be famous or infamous. Uh, run with it. Now, at the time, this was a horrible thought. I mean, here I just had two people telling me I was going to cause grave harm to my nation's security, and I should go with it independently of whether or not that goes on. And this is what I call a shadow motivation. In psychology, there's something called our shadow sides. They're the sides of ourselves that are so socially unacceptable that we cannot admit them to ourselves, even at a conscious level. But at an unconscious level, they run us around. And you'll see in the... Uh, in the book, one of my shadow sides was being an arrogant Jewish professor from New York. Well, there's a fine line between arrogance and courage, and I won't, don't have time to go into that here. I mean, taking on NSA took a certain amount of arrogance or courage, depending on your perspective. Um, so what usually would be a shadow motivation that I wouldn't even be consciously aware of had somehow bubbled up to the surface. And I liken this to, in a movie, you know how in a movie they often show an actor with a devil on his shoulder whispering in his ear, telling him to do something bad? Well, that was the devil on my shoulder. Now, back in January 1976, I thought that I got that devil off my shoulder. <clears throat> but five years later, in 1981, I realized I had fooled myself. What happened, I was watching a video documentary about the making of the first atom bomb it was called Day After Trinity, because Trinity is the name of the test site in New Mexico where they did the first test of an atomic device in July 1945. And I don't have time to go into the details here, but again, it's covered in the book. <clears throat> the, um, and even better, you can buy the, the DVD, and I, uh, uh, the Day After Trinity DVD on, on, on Amazon. Um, they interviewed all of the, not, they interviewed a number of the scientists who'd worked on the um, Manhattan Project, and they asked them for their motivation. Why did you work on this horrible weapon of mass destruction? And they all get excited, and they say, Nazi Germany. The Nazi fission, nuclear fission, had been discovered in Germany in 1938, if I remember, by Hahn, uh, Fisch and Hahn. And um, if the Nazis got the atom bomb before we did, it would be a thousand years of dark ages. But then later in the documentary, they come back to each of those scientists and they ask them, why when Nazi Germany was defeated in May of 1945, did you continue working on this uh, weapon of mass destruction, which was then used on Japan, not Germany? And their faces fall and they do not know why they did. And again, I don't have time to go into the details, but there's more in the book and even more watch the video. And watching that video, I believe I knew what happened. They had shadow motivations. Their socially acceptable motivation for working on the bomb was Nazi Germany. But they had others. Is my brain powerful enough to destroy a city? Could I be the war hero? Killing hundreds of thousands of men, William, men women, and children in an instant would be a horrible way to become a war hero. And yet, so that's why it would be a shadow motivation. And I made a vow 
uh, watching that, never to fool myself again. That is, what back in 1976, when I thought I'd brushed the devil off my shoulder, I'd fooled myself. I had been governed by my shadow motivation. Now, fortunately, the decision I made in January 1976 was the right one. And this doesn't come just from me. Admiral Bobby Inman, who was director of NSA and fighting me back then uh, on this issue, it, two years ago in a Stanford alumni magazine article for which he was interviewed, it's all about this first crypto war and I highly recommend it, um, was asked if he would, with what he now knows, would he still try to suppress my work, would, my publications? And his answer was just the opposite. He would try to get it out as quickly as possible because he could now see, and he cited a theft of portions of the F-35 jet design by a foreign power as proof that American, even American national security depended on strong encryption. But it was a, just a matter of sheer luck that I made the right decision. I could just as well have fooled myself. So that first crypto war <clears throat> was largely about freedom to publish papers. And that came to a head in July 1977, so about a year and a half after the devil on my shoulder incident, when a man named Joseph Meyer, an IEEE member, wrote from his home address in Maryland to IEEE headquarters, I think it was in New York at the time, uh, maybe, maybe it was in Jersey by then, saying that as an IEEE member, he was very concerned that the IEEE was breaking the law by publishing certain papers. Now, a very interesting thing goes on here. When people talk about cryptography, at least in those days, but I suspect it's still true today, they talk in code. And he never, so Meyer never said, you're publishing Hellman's papers, you're breaking the law. He cited like five IEEE journal issues that he felt were in violation of the law. And I had a paper in four out of the five. The IEEE wrote back to Joseph Meyer, thanking him for his concern, saying they were well aware of this law. It's called the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR. But it was always the IEEE's position that they were unable to uh, judge what papers were in violation. It was up to the authors and their institutions to make sure they were not violating the ITAR. The IEEE, in code, let me know about this. They sent a copy to me because I was on the board of governors of the information theory group of the IEEE, now the Information Theory Society. Uh, but they didn't send it to all the governors of uh, the information theory group. And so again, they were saying, hey, Hellman, he's talking about you. So I took the letter to Stanford's general counsel, a man at the time was uh, John Schwartz, and he took a few days to review the letter, and I came back, and he's, uh, he said, um, f he said, first of all, it was okay to go ahead and continue publishing my papers, giving my talks. The university was willing to take that risk, because remember, the author's institutions were potentially liable. He also said, if I was prosecuted, the university would defend me, and that was very important to me, because just being uh, prosecuted can bankrupt you, hiring a law firm to defend you. If I was convicted, they would uh, appeal. But then his last words, uh, as p this part of the, t uh, the conversation, but I have to warn you, if all appeals are exhausted, we obviously can't go to jail for you. But I wasn't worried. I felt we were on solid ground. And in fact, history shows that we were. And, but he, Schwartz also recommended that um, several months from then, in October 1977, there was an, information, an international symposium on information theory sponsored by the IEEE at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And I had two papers there, one with a student, Steve Polig, and another with Ralph Merkel. And I had planned for the students to go with me to the conference, to the symposium, and to deliver the papers. John said, I strongly recommend that you, meaning me, give the papers rather than the students because a newly minted PhD's career would be greatly inhibited by a multi-year court case, which didn't happen but was a risk at that point in time, whereas I was a tenured professor, my career could withstand a, um, a, a case like that. So I went to the students. They, I told them I was happy to give the papers. I felt comfortable with Stanford's financial backing. The students initially very bravely said, no, they would give the papers anyway. Uh, but a week later, they come back to me, and they say, our parents are giving us a really hard time. 
they're really worried. So why don't you go ahead and give the paper? So when it came time for each of the papers at Cornell, I went up to the podium with the student, and everyone knew what was going on, so I could use shorthand. I said, normally Steve or Ralph would be giving this paper, but on the advice of legal counsel, I will be giving it instead. But I want the student to get the credit he deserves, and so even though I will be the one speaking from all perspectives except legally, I want you to consider the words coming from my mouth as if they're coming from his. And of course, the students got more attention, more credit that way than they ever would have if there hadn't been this, this problem. Now, an important thing to notice here is NSA and I were fighting this out in the press. And in fact, NSA was never doing it directly. It always came from letters from home addresses and things like that. And that's a very bad way to communicate. So in fact, um, freedom through communications, right? One of my favorite quips is from George Bernard Shaw. The biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has happened. And so we need to, if you're going to have any hope of communicating, you need to talk directly and you also need to listen. In the mid-1990s, oh, so first of all, 1978, so about a year after the Cornell conference, I get a call from NSA headquarters. Uh, Admiral Inman, the direct, then the director of NSA, is would, going to be in California and he would like to meet with you. Are you willing? I jumped at the opportunity because here was a chance to communicate directly rather than through the press. And when I met Admiral Inman, he told me that he was meeting with me against the advice of all the other senior people at the agency. But he said, I don't see the harm in talking. Very out of the box play, uh, position and Admiral Inman in fact is famous for this. He's, he's a very open guy. And he also looked at me and he said, it's nice to see you don't have horns. Because people at NSA were obviously painting me as the devil incarnate. Now, of course, I had been doing, I had been demonizing NSA, so I looked back at him and said, same here. Now, our initial meeting was very cautious. Our relationship was cautious, as you can see from the horns comment. But over the years, it, we developed actually a friendship. And that was important because it allowed us to resolve a number of issues and in fact to improve cybersecurity for the American public and for the world in very major ways by talking and by getting to know one another. And I think that's what's needed today. And specifically, in the mid-1990s, Congress asked the National Research Council, the American research arm of our academies of science, engineering, and, and, and medicine, to undertake a study of American cryptographic policy and particular export restrictions. And this committee included privacy advocates like myself. It included uh, representatives from industry like Raymond Ozzie, who had just designed Lotus Notes and later became Microsoft's uh, uh, chief software architect, replacing Bill Gates, uh, represented the tech industry. And we had Benjamin Civiletti, who had been Attorney General under uh, Jimmy Carter, representing the FBI and law enforcement's interests. We had Ann Cara Christie, a former Deputy Director at NSA, representing NSA's interests. And by talking, but even more importantly, listening, our committee, by, and also by putting aside our prejudices as we came in, we were able to reach unanimous conclusions that greatly loosened the export restrictions and. So that's an important thing. I was the hero in the press in the 70s, but we didn't have strong encryption. If we want strong encryption, we have to want more than good press coverage. We have to want to talk. Now, cybersecurity often depends more on government regulations than on technology. That was true then, and it's true today. And so I, I've been saying for a while that the FBI and the tech industry, the privacy advocates, should be talking. And the same is true in the European Union and other places where the uh, legislative bodies are trying to implement exceptional access. And when I got back from Vienna at the end of October, having just given my Turing lecture, I decided I should actually do what I was saying. And so I started putting out feelers to the FBI in particular to see if we can start an off-the-record conversation to try to get to know one another and really discuss what is best for the nation rather than fighting it out in the press. Those of you who are from other countries, I would encourage you to do a similar thing in your own nations. And if, you, if you're in the United States and you have people that you think should be involved in this, please get in touch with me. 
um, um, my, there's an email address that you can use that's on my Stanford website. Uh, because we really need to find ways to get past posturing and, and, and really get better security for the public as a whole. Now, you might say right now we have good security. Um, in the Apple FBI situation, Apple has basically prevailed at this point. But we have a new administration coming in in this country and a Republican-controlled Congress, which has been much more on the side of law enforcement than on the side of the tech industry. And I don't think adequately understands the technical limitations. So the importance of doing this was e is even greater now than it was a month ago. So with that, I will stop and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Hellman, for an interesting, such an interesting talk. So I would like to present to you the uh, plaque from the Archipelic Communications Society for this excellent keynote speech.